200 micron. So this one is about 100 micron diameter fibers. So it's like a hair. And then if you look closer, it's not just a solid thing. It's actually a, a bunch of bundles of nanotubes. So if you look at those, this is what I call a bundle. So this is about 100 microns. So that bundle, this is 10 microns. So this is a few microns. So if you look inside, you have individual nanotubes okay, with a nanometer uh, <coughs> size, and they are like forming like uh, twisted, so that they form those bundles. So what kind of ID curve do I get? If it was a diode, kind of like exponential behavior, right? This would be your first guess. But it's not true really quite what you get. So between the tip and the anode, you go to a thousand volts, so I'm only, only showing you the display of the 500. So for a diode, the terminal voltage would be 0.6 volts, but here you need to wait about 500, 250 volts before we start moving to touch the current. Remember the people who wanted for application, they would like this current to be about 10 milliamps. So we are not quite there yet, right? It's from 5. So what's the difference between these two? Well, sometimes you use that material, which is a pure carbon fiber, but then you try to put the lower function material on top so it emits faster and more. So in this case, they deposited titanium carbide, and indeed, the same fiber coated or uncoated, you need to worry about to emit more current uh, at a specific bias. Okay. Now, we say, does this fit an exponential, exponential BDE over BT that you would do for a diode? And the answer is no, because of that forward normal thing I was talking about, it's quite a bit different curve. Now, as a function of time, so there's a closer view. And the, how do we cut the fiber, by the way? Because they send it to us as long string. So the crudest way you take scissors and snap it, or you take a razor blade. But then you end up with something which is very egg, eggy, uh, red, uh, let's say, rugged. Or you use a laser that is more clean cut. Okay, and then all these little nanotubes are sitting there at the top, maybe with different lengths, and they are going to emit. That distance, I cannot read it, but say roughly 500 microns. And then what you do, you sweep the voltage. So this is at zero. You go from zero to 1,000 volts. You stay at 1,000 volts for about an hour. And then you bring it back down to zero. So as a function of time, what is your current doing? You start at zero volts. You get 250 such limit. So this is a function of time, right? At this point, you have to use the maximum voltage of 1,000 volts. Then you leave it there. You go for lunch. You come back after lunch. You see the curve. And then after lunch, it decays. And you get this. So you see that when it's sitting at the top, it's, there's some fluctuation right, in the current. So despite the fact that you put this, if you look and sit and eat your lunch while looking at the computer, you may see some little growing spots. So these are these little antennas, <coughs> little tiny rockets are sitting there, and some of them start carrying so much current that they start to burn. So the tip of them evaporates, so you literally sit me, sitting there, you see some little lightning rod, like a flashlight moving here, and you are killing some of the tubes. So that tube being killed leads to that fluctuation in the current, even though you are sitting at 1,000 volts. If you push it really too much, then you could really burn the whole thing. And then when you come back, you see, you look at the fiber, you look on the screen, and all of a sudden, you see the thing is gone. So you just fry the fiber, because it was attached at the coat, and you push too much current through it, and basically, it's attached to silver paint, and the silver paint there, and your fiber disappears. We have tried to put, since we were not able to get several million, we put a few of them and sort of put them close to each other, thinking that if you put three, you should get three times what you get with one. And as I was looking at them, I saw them forming like a bouquet. And basically, they were like repelling each other as you were trying to. So it's very tough to make if you read at 10 million. Furthermore, if you see, remember, this is going up. So there may be a thousand cubes here before contributing. You stay there, you start burning some of them. So some of them degrade. So when you end up, instead of a thousand, you maybe have 945 of them here. Some of them have burned. Right? So as you sweep down, you don't expect the IV curve to be exactly the same on the way up and down. So you expect to see some hysteresis. So if I plot this function of voltage, here I sit for an hour. I'm feeling some of the tube, and you see the current just come back down and then well, it comes back down in the other direction, so I have to make some hysteria. So we need to understand that. So what I was trying to qualitatively show you here with a marker, I'm showing you what the score of the people did so long ago, just a few years after the quantum mechanics was born. Here is your metal with the Fermi level. What is the Fermi level in the metal? Any 
Any idea? How many EB? How many? Four or five EB, right? Typical. And then you, uh, you go into vacuum. Right? So you see there, the electrons don't go there until you put enough protection. So if I put quite a bit, then it becomes something like this, right? So basically, once an electron moves out, if you remember your EMM field, you get a charge. So if you have a positive electron, so an negative electron here, you get a positive charge, an image charge coming through, a traffic back into the metal. So you have two competing forms. One, due to the image charge you leave in the metal, and the other one due to the electric field you put outside. When you sum the two, the triangular one due to the field, and the one due to the image charge, you get something like a hump like this. And you can see the more field you put, you push this down, the more that hump is going to come down, and the more electron will come out. So the same thing there, the formula log you can sum or through, or if you are in the, the Fermi-derived pair of the distribution, you can go over that Fermi, the fermionic emission. So you get contribution from both. So if you calculate the current coming out as a function of the bias, what do you get? Where do you get the formal normal equation? So what kind of field is acting at the tip? Well, if it was a parallel plane capacitor, it's voltage divided by distance between the two plates, right? But this is something pointy, so the equity there would be much bigger than that. That's why you call the field existing at the tip is much bigger than the power plate capacitor. It's enhanced by the beta factor. So you have to take that into account in the forward ordering theory. Because when forward ordering did it, they did it for flat surface. So now that we do it for nanotubes, you need that enhancement factor. But when you are done doing it, forward ordering showed that as a function of the bias, the triangular barrier, it's not an exponential. It's not like a diode. It's not like a DJT. But it's V squared times this. Right? So how do I know that it's for an ordain? Well, do the following. Divide by V squared, okay, and take the logarithm on both sides. So I get logarithm of I over V squared is logarithm of the A minus V over A, V over V. So if I'm plotting along the y-axis this quantity and along the x-axis this quantity, it's y equal to A x plus B. So it's a straight line with a negative slope. So the data fit a foreign ordain which corresponds to emission through a triangular tip. My IV data, which I was plotting as a, like a diode, are not actually a diode. They are something which is called a foreign ordain equation. So there it is. I will show you again another curve in which the hysteresis was much more drastic. Right? Sweep up, sweep down. And then here I'm not plotting quite logarithm. I'm just plotting logarithm on I versus here. Why did I do that? Because so this is just on the upsweep. I see two different slopes. Okay, I'm going to come back to this. And then I'm plotting what I just said. Those data, instead of logarithm of i, I'm plotting logarithm of i over b squared. Okay. So when I transition from 1 to 2, I transition from this to this. But as you can see, the data here or here are very well approximated by two different straight lines. Right? So indeed, remember a straight line when you use those type of coordinates according to foreign ordain, correspond to forward ordain emission. So why do I have two slopes? It means there must be two different types of tubes contributing to the emission. Some of them are covered with oxygen because the uh, pressure in the chamber is never perfect, right? So there's some uh, oxygen or water vapor. And basically what, what we have shown is when you are in this regime here, there is still water vapor attached. But as the tube is increasing in temperature, as you are putting more and more potential, the water molecules disappear, and now you get field emission from the bare nanotubes, okay, which are forming the fiber. So I don't want to go to that. I can show you that we actually found the number. Remember, there was a logarithm of A and a B factor. So once you do put your data and you do a fit, the red curve gives you the coefficient. And of course, they are different whether you are <coughs> here or here. You can also see what I was talking about before. It's not perfect line, right? There is some deviation due to the fact that some tubes are being killed and so on. Now, uh, I won't go through this. It's basically showing you we have uh, what's called an RGA. What is RGA? It's a residual gas analysis uh, on the chamber. So remember that chamber, there is one which what type of gas is coming out of the tube as you heat it up? 
Remember, it's never perfect, so there'll be water vapor, CO, and CO2 in the chamber. And as you increase the bias on the fiber, it gets hot, so it's get, getting rid of all those water molecules of CO2. And how do you do that? By measuring the change in the partial pressure. So it is as a function of bias. Remember, I was telling you two different regimes, one and two. They are the water molecule, and CO is still attached, and there it will disappear. And correspondingly, you see a change in the pressure, partial pressure of those molecules in the chamber. Claiming you that indeed the fluid is still leaving the CO2. So you could think of another application in which you actually use a tube to grasp the CO molecule. In fact, you could put the, those fibers inside the engine to try to, or at least less dirt in the atmosphere. So not just to kill people, but also to, for useful applications. Now, how do we know the tube gets hot? Well, as I said, you go, remember you sweep up, you stay there for lunch, but if you approach it too much, then the field is going to be higher, so the tube is going to get hotter. And this is what indeed we see when we see the fiber here. It kind of looks messy at the top because this one was chopped with the razor blade, so the tubes are all messed up at the top. But then we see the thing glowing. This is the space charge emitting regime I was talking about. The charge member here. You emit so much that you form a plasma in front of the tip, and then it starts glowing. Then the, your current sort of saturates, and then as you increase the bias, you see that, that those glowing spots start going down the fiber. Because what can come from the top is saturated. There is no way you can get more electron from there because of the plasma. So the electron in the tube say, well, I'm going to emit from the side then. And as you do that more and more, as you put more bias, that lightning thing just goes down and eventually can fry you to the, your uh, fiber. So if you look at the fiber, why is it emitting from the side? This is what the fiber looks like. This is a fiber from uh, in Cambridge. Remember, I was saying these are maybe 100 microns in diameter, and these are the individual nanotubes. So, of course, when you eyeball it, you never see that, but you do an SEM scanning like from microscope image of this, and you see that the, the side of the fiber has like spaghetti things like all around. So, this is very pointy, so it actually can emit, right? If you can only get it from the top, it's going to look from the side and say, hey, wait a minute, there's lightning rod all over the place there, I can emit from. Right? And the more you will increase the bias, the more down the fiber it will go. There's another view, for the view, how messy that thing can be. Now look at the top. This was laser cut. So uh, this is to be about 40 micron long. So you see there's like a stuff, when you make those fibers, sometimes you use nickel seeds to be able to grow the fiber, uh, the nanotube, and as you grow the fiber, some of those get trapped, and eventually whatever you chop the fiber, there may be one which is just right there. But at the end of the day, you can see that those nanotubes are not perfectly regimented. It's really a bunch of spaghetti sticking up, right? It's like a bad haircut. So you just <laughs> basically, which one is going to emit the longest one? So this one will emit first, and then the tiny one which are down here, eventually they are shielded by this. But now you can understand where the noise comes from, right? You have all these tubes, different lengths, and you have thousands of them emitting. That's why once you reach the top, there is a flickering in the noise in the current level because some of them start to burn. Okay. Again, example of the, the, the hysteresis in the curve. So what would you expect? This is a distance between anode and cathode. Right? So as I approach closer, and I'm going to sleep the same thousand volts, and of course, the closer I come, the more I'm going to burn some of them. Right? So you see the history of this curve, if it keeps on increasing, and eventually you see a big chunk of the tube just fell off. Because you were burning so many of them, but there may be a, a bundle of them just sitting on the corner, and they get burned because they were burning all the time. So any jagged thing in the curve is a sign, basically, that uh, some have been being chopped off, but again, the size of the history is increases as you come closer. And even what we notice when we came very close, then it just happened there, and that's when that tube disappeared. I was looking at on the screen, and it burned. And of course, I get no current on the way down. Right? So I came too close, and I just basically carried too much current, and I just killed the tube. Now, this is I versus D, right? So let me take one curve and do the forward normal plot. So what should I get? The algorithm of I versus D squared, if I, one of the V, I should get a straight line. So indeed, it's going to the triangular well, more and more electron in front of the cathode. Eventually, you have so much that you form a plasma in front of